You may be surprised to know that the Buddha did discuss ways in which we do, can be said to have a self. In one of these uh, early suttas, the Buddha describes just such a way. It's a subtle and complex way, but I think it's one that I haven't discussed uh, before in these videos and is worth looking at. If you're new to these videos of mine and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to this channel and click the bell down below when you, if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. Oftentimes in these videos, what I do is to discuss aspects of early Buddhism. Uh, that's kind of the focus of this channel, um, early Buddhism from a sort of a contemporary perspective. And so what I want to do is to look at one early sutta in which the Buddha discusses this notion of the self in a rather unique and interesting way. Now, I've, I've mentioned in the past on these videos how the, the, the Buddha's notion of a self is subtle and complicated. If you think that the Buddha said that there was literally no self, uh, then you're not getting the Buddha's uh, position correct. If, on the other hand, you believe that the Buddha said there literally was a self, you're also not getting the Buddha's position really correct. His position is subtle and somewhere in between these two extremes, which is, again, what makes it so difficult and, uh, to, to, to sort of get our minds around and understand com uh, correctly. So, in a sense, there isn't a self, and in a sense, there is a self. Now, subtleties like these are not the best to get across in YouTube videos. Uh, I think most people who watch YouTube videos don't particularly like subtleties. They sort of want something easy to understand, direct, simple, you know, in short sentences and so on, and so, oh well. <laughs> that's just the way things are. Um, that's what I'm doing on my channel, is to try to get at some of the depths here that we find in early Buddhism and in the Buddha's actual teachings, at least as they come across to us in the early suttas. So, one of these suttas is uh, called the Potapada Sutta. Uh, it's a fascinating sutta. It's a, a, a sutta about a wanderer named Potapada. And uh, as well as having a number, I mean, it's too much for me to discuss. I'm not going to discuss the whole sutta in this video. There's a lot of stuff in there. I'll only be discussing one part of it. But it's a, it's a, a deep, a great sutta to read and to uh, study, partly because Potapada is in a situation that's similar to our own in certain respects. Potapada is a beginner. He doesn't really understand a whole lot of the Buddha's teachings. He's confused by them. However, he's in a position where he knows the Buddha, he likes the Buddha, he thinks that the Buddha is a wise person, and so he's very prone to listen to and accept what the Buddha is telling him. However, as I say, he doesn't really understand it. So the Buddha tries to teach Potapada and is quite kind with him when it's clear that Potapada doesn't really grasp a lot of what the Buddha is saying. And in this, I think we can distinguish this kind of uh, discussion that the Buddha is having in this sutta from the discussions that, let's say, the Buddha might have with a monastic who is being intransigent in some respect. With intransigent monastics, the Buddha can get quite sharp, but with Potapada, even though Potapada really is not necessarily on the same wavelength as the Buddha, the Buddha is very kind with him because he understands that Potapada is a, is a beginner and not a monastic. He's just somebody who is an interested layperson, like ourselves, perhaps. And so we can get into uh, this discussion, I think, by reading it. And one of the main sticking points for Potapada, we won't be surprised, is the idea of a self. Uh, the Buddha's idea of a self, which Potapada doesn't really quite grasp. Now, in particular, Potapada wants there to be a, an essential permanent self. And so, sort of keeps bringing the discussion back in that, you know, to that, you know, that there's, isn't there a sort of a permanent self, you know, a self like we all believe there must be a soul, basically. And the Buddha tells him in various ways that that kind of way of approaching the self is, is not very helpful. In particular, if there is such a self, it, it's nothing that we experience, because all of our experiences are always changing. 
And so if there is such a, an unchanging permanent soul, it's nothing that we ever actually experience, which is kind of odd. Now in the sutta, Puttapada had gone to talk with, to the Buddha with a friend of his named Chitta, the son of an elephant trainer. And Chitta apparently seems to have been a monastic in the past. And then at least the story goes, he got into an argument with some people in the monastery and eventually disrobed, left the monastery. And now Chitta is sort of thinking of perhaps coming back into the monastery, or at least he's interested in what the Buddha has to say. And Puttapada is sort of trying to, you know, sort of reintroduce him to the Buddha. They're going together. And so Chitta is also interested in these same kinds of topics that Potapada is interested in, these topics about the self. And in particular, Chitta is interested in a somewhat deeper topic, uh, which is this topic of what we might call personal continuity over time. So that's, after all, the sort of, you know, if we're going to go down in depth one level from uh, Potapada's concern about the self, you know, are we permanent, you know, souls somehow? Well, that question sort of resolves itself into something a little deeper of what is, what is there to personal continuity over time? What is there to me being the same person in the past, the present, and the future? That, after all, is really what we're getting at when we're asking about the self, really. And so Chitta gets into this discussion with the Buddha, and the discussion then eventually turns around a, a somewhat a technical term in Pali, the, the, it's, it's a compound term, the, the term is Attapatilaba, and there's many ways of translating that term, uh, but for today's purposes, for this purposes, I'm just going to translate it as an acquired self. It's basically our internal idea of who we are, our internal concept of our self. Uh, it also has uh, connotations in, uh, in Buddhism of coming into being, of sort of bringing oneself into being, or even of rebirth, of, of, of bringing oneself into being in a future life. So it has all kinds of connotations, but I think for the purposes of our discussion and for the purposes of this sutta, I'm going to stick with you know, this, this idea of an acquired self, that is, our acquired uh, concept of who we are. This acquired self is our ordinary concept of self that we, that we have in daily life. Uh, so, and, and where does it come from? Well, it comes from whatever distinctive features in our mind and body we latch on to. And those, what's crucial here is that, as we'll see, those distinctive features tend to change over time. So when we're younger, we may think of ourselves as children, as youthful. We may think of ourselves as young students in a particular grade of, at school. We may think of ourselves as second graders or fifth graders. Uh, eventually, we may think of ourselves as high schoolers or as university students or as graduates. When we're in a different stage of life, we may think of ourselves as parents or as business people uh, holding down a job, job holders. We may think of ourselves as uh, retirees, as uh, senior citizens, or not. Many people who, uh, in fact, are older in life or retirees may uh, very much not think of themselves that way and, and rather cling to an early, quote-unquote, earlier, that is to say, a, 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 a a, an atapatilaba, a, a concept of, you know, a concept of self that many of us would think of as holding earlier in life. This depends on culture, too. In certain cultures, uh, we really do strive to remain young all the time, whereas in other cultures, uh, the position of being an elder in society is something that is uh, held to quite happily and indeed uh, celebrated. So again, this is, a lot of this is cultural, a lot of this is personal, having to do with our own personal psychology. But all of it, all of these concepts of a self depend upon the features that are around us in our body and mind at the time 
that we feel are particularly salient to who we are, those features that we grasp at and identify with. So at each of these times in our lives, we have this acquired self, this atapatilaba. But over time, that acquired self changes. Now, so taking that acquired self as permanent, as somehow essential to who we are, would be a kind of delusion. So how are we to understand this, this acquired self? How are we to understand this? The Buddha asks Chitta a number of very pointed questions. He says, and now Chitta, what if they then were to ask thus, that past acquired self that you had, is that your real acquired self? And that the future acquired self is non-existent and the present acquired self non-existent? Or, the future acquired self that you will have, is that your real acquired self? And that the past acquired self is non-existent and the present acquired self non-existent? Or, the acquired self that you now have, is that your real acquired self? And that the past acquired self is non-existent and the future acquired self non-existent? That is, the Buddha is asking Chitta, Okay, given that these acquired selves change over time, which of them is your real self, right? Um, I mean, if, if you really are, uh, you know, a business person, if that's who you really are, then you're not really a second grader, and you're not really a retiree, right? Those things don't really exist. Who you really are is the business person. That's at least one option of the ones that the Buddha is suggesting here for citta. It's rather like in some uh, schools of Christianity, it's believed that at the end of days when God returns to the earth, that all of the uh, anointed people, all of the blessed people will be bodily resurrected. They'll be resurrected in the body. Um, this is an old idea that goes back to uh, the origins of Christianity. Uh, the problem with that, or one concern, one question would be, which body will you be resurrected in, right? So if you're literally resurrected bodily, well, over your lifetime, you've had an infinite number of bodies, right? You've, you've had a baby body, you've had a second grader body, you've had a, an adult body and a, an older body, if you had the luck to live that old. So which body are you going to be resurrected in? And this is actually something of a question that's, uh, that theologians have to con contend with. Uh, is it, you know, they'll, they'll say it's some perfected body from when you were back in your 20s or something like that, whenever you were sort of your most beautiful or something. I mean, there's going to be, I don't know how they answer it, but that's, uh, that's one answer I think I seem to have remembered hearing somewhere. Uh, or is it some amalgam of these in some way, and, and then what is that amalgam? So that's the, that's the kind of dilemma that the Buddha is trying to set up here uh, with his question to Chitta. And so Chitta then responds to the Buddha. When there was my past acquired self, only that is real, and the future one does not exist, the present one does not exist. When there is my present acquired self, only that is real, and the past one does not exist, the future one does not exist. When there will be my future acquired self, only that is real, and the present one does not exist, the past one does not exist. Now, the interesting thing here is that the Buddha agrees with Chitta. The Buddha agrees that when these acquired selves uh, are reflected, I mean, in other words, when you hold to them at the time, they're real for a time, but then they pass away and they're no longer real. So one of them was real in the past and then isn't real in the present and the future. Another one is real in the present, but wasn't in the past and the future, right? I mean, when we were young, the real acquired self of being the second grader, that was a real acquired self. That was real. Uh, but at the time, we were not a business person nor a retiree. When we're a business person, then we're not a second grader and we're not a retiree. You get the point. Um, so these selves are real to an extent. And this is one of the ways in which the Buddha did, clearly did not say that there was literally no self. However, these real selves, quote-unquote, 
only persist for a very short period of time. Indeed, if we're, if we're uh, honest about it, if we're thinking deeply about it, we can see that these acquired cells might only persist for a few moments because somebody may think of themselves, let's say, as a business person while they're out working, but when they get home, they may think of themselves as a parent or as a tinkerer in the garage or something. Uh, so it's not, it's not as though the acquired self has to persist for even a day or a week or a year. These will come and go as, our, as the features around us change. And here the, the Buddha gives a wonderful simile as he tends to do uh, so often in the early texts. And one of, the, one of the things that makes the early texts so fruitful, I think, is to consider his similes. So he says that this idea of this acquired self, he says it's rather like a cow. A cow gives milk and the milk uh, can be made into curds or it can be made into butter and then the butter can be made into ghee and so on. Uh, but when the milk is milk, it's not ghee or butter or curds. And when, the, when it's curds, it's not milk or butter or ghee. And when it's butter, it's not milk or curds or ghee. We get the point. Um, now, I don't think that you change curds into butter, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, for the purposes of the simile, let's assume that they do, that you do change, that this, this is a, you know, a, a linear kind of causal stream here. Um, uh, it, it doesn't matter, but that, that's the general, I think, the, the point that the Buddha is trying to make is that we have a sort of a linear causal stream here between milk on the one hand and ghee on the, on the other hand. But as the material changes, it has a different name. Now, I mean, it's all sort of this lactic stuff that gets changed uh, just as, right, there's a sort of a a stream of mental and physical states, which is you or which is me, but we have it internally a different uh, concept of self all the time. In the same way, with this lactic stuff, it, it, we have a different name for it when it's at different stages along this kind of causal process. So just as we go from milk to curds to butter to ghee, so we go from a baby to a first grader, second grader, third grader, whatever, graduate, business person, retiree, so on. It's the same idea. However, the Buddha stresses, he says, these are the world's usages, terms, expressions, and descriptions, which the Tathagata, that is the Buddha, uses without misapprehending them. That is, the wise person uses these terms for the self at various times in life, or uses these concepts of a self, not as something that reveals something uh, literally fundamental and unchanging and essential with who we are, but rather as terms that express a certain stage of life or a certain kind of concept of life that is temporary, that is fleeting, that may be gone in an hour or even a minute and replaced by something else. And if we understand it in those terms, then there's no problem with it. So this whole topic of, of change over time and of permanence over time or the lack thereof and of finding unity in this diversity of life over a period of time is something that I did a past video about as well, a similar video, and I will leave a link to it up here on the screen if you haven't seen it. If you're getting something out of these videos of mine, uh, please consider taking a look over at my Patreon page, which is linked down below, and considering potentially helping out the channel and supporting what we do here. Thanks so much to all of my patrons over on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on the next video.